so good. Good morning. My name is Nicole Romero. Yeah, Harlem Globetrotters deserve a clap every single time. Um, <laughs> hi, good morning. My name is Nicole Romero. I am the creative arts pastor here at The Crossing. And we are, we're in this series called Atomic Summer, where every week we're looking at just one small thing we can do that will make a big difference in our lives. And today we are talking about rest. So if we're talking about rest, why a video of the Harlem Globetrotters before we get into it? Well, I'm going to read you a verse. This is Jesus talking about rest. And see if you can find the word in this verse that ties to the video we just saw. Okay, ready? Here we go. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Does anyone know what the word is in there that reminds you of Harlem Globetrotters and Stomp? Rhythms. Yeah, you guys are on it this morning. Rhythms. We are talking about rhythms of work and rest. There is a work-rest rhythm to the way Jesus has designed life. It's like music. It's like those songs we just got to sing. If all the band did and all those singers did was just shout out one note at you the entire time, it wouldn't move your soul the way that it does when they come in and out and there's a rhythm to it. It's like the Harlem Globetrotters and Stomp. There is a lightness and a freedom to it. There's a rhythm to what they're doing. And that's what our lives should feel like when we are living this work-rest rhythm that God has designed for us. We should feel light and free. And of course, those guys work nonstop to get that good and to look that free and light. And yes, we will have to work to get to that place, but there is a value in rest that we are missing. And when we learn to value rest, the rhythm of freedom and lightness and grace and beauty starts to come out in what we are doing. There's even, there's this moment in Jesus' life where he calls himself the master of the Sabbath. And Sabbath is the biblical word for rest. And I had always heard that verse as in Jesus is in charge of the Sabbath, right? He's the master of it. And just recently I started hearing it as like Mr. Miyagi, like I am the master of the Sabbath. I have mastered rest. And so work with me and I will show you the rhythms of what it looks like to work and to rest. Jesus is the Harlem Globetrotter of rest. So to get us started, we're just going to do a little self-assessment. How are you feeling this morning? Are you tired? Are you overworked? Do you feel overwhelmed? Are there things in your life that are making you tired? Yeah, so I see like half of you raise your hands, the other half are just too tired to raise your hands. I get it. It's too much work. Look, just like one finger. I have a friend who fell asleep tying her shoes, so she missed an appointment. That's how tired she was. We are all a little overworked. We are exhausted, and we are over it. So Psychology Today has a list of signs that you are overworked. These are the alarm bells that can go off for you when you are overworked. Take a look at these and see if any of these are you. So chronically tired, insomnia, forgetfulness, dizziness, change in eating habits, increased irritability, any of you? Uh, apathy, clutter is building. So for me, my two biggest ones are clutter is building, so my car starts to get full of stuff. I start having like 20 tabs open on my computer in Chrome. That's how you know I'm really stressed. One of my friends also knows that forgetfulness is one of my big tells that I am overworked. I don't know about you. So for Christmas, because he loves me slash likes to make fun of me, he gave me five tiles. Do you know what a tile is? You like put it in things so you can find it. So there's a tile on my keys. I've got five tiles in my wallet, in my backpack, on my keys. Because he knows when I'm here and I'm running around and I'm overworked, I'll say this line like, hey, I don't know where my keys are, so if you see them, can you just tell me where you saw them so that I can find them? That's how I know I am overworked. What are yours? What are your alarm bells that go off when you are overworked? Because the thing is, we know, we know when we're overworked, and yet we think, I can do one more little thing. I can do one more thing. Just get one more thing done. And it makes me think of this horrible fact I learned. And have you ever heard of free diving? So, Look at how beautiful this is. Except I told you it's a horrible fact, so now you're like, is a shark coming to get him? Like, what's happening? Okay, freediving 
looks like the most amazing thing. It's, it's like scuba diving, except you don't wear an air tank. And so you practice learning to hold your breath for as long as possible so that you can swim to these incredible places and just be free without all the equipment on you. And it looks amazing, but it is super, super dangerous. And it's not dangerous because of sharks, like you'd think it would be. It's not dangerous because you're gonna drown at the bottom of the ocean. The most common cause of death for freedivers is shallow drowning. Because they have these alarms that go off on their wrists, but the alarms go off and they're near the bottom and they just think, I'm just gonna do one more thing. I'm just gonna go through one more cavern, I'm gonna follow one more fish, I'm gonna do one more thing, and then I will head to the surface. But by the time they head to the surface, it's too late. And they don't actually make it all the way to the surface. They make it within two feet, a foot, and they pass out. And if they don't have a friend who's close enough to them to notice, they've got maybe a minute before they drown. And this is us. We are free diving through life. And it's great, and we're accomplishing things, and we're doing stuff. But then our alarms are going off, and we don't listen to them. And we think, I can do one more thing. I can do one more thing. And then it's too late by the time we actually turn around and try to get to the surface and the time we try to rest. And like Andrew talked about last week, most of us, we don't have friends that are close enough to us to be able to see us in that emergency and call us out and help us. So our main point for today is that God has designed a rhythm of rest. Intentional, preventative, regularly scheduled rest is necessary for us as humans. We need rest like we need oxygen. But, I mean, be honest, we all kind of know this, right? We all know that we need rest, but we don't actually do it. For all kinds of good reasons, we don't actually turn around and head up when the alarms go off. So, I'm sure there's a couple of you that are really good at your work, rest, rhythm. There's a couple of you who are like, I got this, I am in it, and if you are, can you just come stand by me out by Guest Connect after service so that as people have questions, I'll just have you answer it? Because most of us fall into two other categories. The first one is we just kind of, we stay in this middle ground where we never actually give our work our full energy because we're holding back a little bit because we don't actually know how to rest. And so our lives are never as productive as they should be because we're always holding back. We don't know how to take a real rest. There's also some of us that, especially if you grew up in the Midwest, where rest is just lazy. Weak people need rest. I am not weak, I don't need rest. And everything's gonna fall apart if I rest anyway. You definitely know the value of hard work, but you do not know the value of rest. And in our culture, we have to be really intentional and stubborn if we are going to get any rest. Because we live in a country and a culture where we've got these heroes of overachieving success. For example, have you ever heard of Elon Musk? He's the creator of the Tesla cars. And he even sent a Tesla car to space just to like rub it in our faces that he can do cool things. So this guy, now, he is doing amazing things. He is a genius. But he also says that you need to work 80 to 100 hours a week if you are going to be successful. He admits that those hours are wearing on him, that they are causing pain both in his relational life and in his physical life. For example, his first wife, Justine, said, Elon was obsessed with his work. When he was home, his mind was elsewhere. Because if we don't rest, our relationships suffer. And so last year, Elon was working so much in his office, he basically never left his office. So his fans got together and started a GoFundMe to buy the guy a couch so he could sleep on the couch in his office. And he was living on so much caffeine that he was losing his peripheral vision. But he kept working. And if we don't rest, it will hurt us physically. These examples, people like Elon, they have warped our minds on what success and good life looks like. But if we can learn the rhythms of Jesus' way of life, then we can experience life in a totally different way. We don't have to hold back on our work. We can go full out because we know we're going to get to rest. And we can live a life where there's no demand on us to work 100 hours a week because we've learned the value of rest and we see how we can succeed with even less time going in. Because actually, 
If we include rest in our schedule and we find a rhythm, we'll not only be healthier and happier, but we can accomplish more over time. So this is a great one to bring back to work with you if your boss is asking you to work more than you think you should. Just tell your boss next time about this guy named Jack Nevison, okay? And he crunched a bunch of numbers for several studies that where you work long hours. People like Elon, people like us who think we need to work 100 hours a week to accomplish something. He found there's a ceiling to productive work. He calls it the law of 50. So he went through all these different studies and he found if you work 50 hours a week, you'll get about 37 productive hours. But here's the thing. You work 55 hours and you only get 30 productive hours. There is an inverse relationship between how much you work and how productive you are. You're not a robot. You're a person. You need rest built in, and if you build rest into your work, then you get more actually productive hours. We need intentional, preventative resting. It's not a break from reaching your potential. Resting is not a luxury. It's not lazy. It's not a sign of weakness. It actually improves your productivity, and it saves your life. No wasted hours, no shallow drowning. So for this reason, and lots more, it's not a suggestion from God that we rest. It's a command. It is sown into the creation story. It is in the Ten Commandments. It is central to our existence. And the sooner we pay attention, the more we get to accomplish and the more we get to enjoy our lives. So in the Bible, rest is often called Sabbath, and it was organized on one day. I'm going to give you the 60-second history of Sabbath. God called his people to him. He said, hey, guys, you need to rest. They didn't rest. They didn't rest at all. They didn't let their slaves rest. They didn't let their animals rest. They didn't let anybody rest. And so their lives fell totally apart. So God came in, saved them, fixed it, chastised them, and then they became incredibly strict about rest, so strict about rest. Isn't it funny how humans can do that? We can make rest the hardest thing we have to do. So they made rest the hardest thing you have to do. And this is where Jesus entered the story. And so generally for us, because of Jesus, we don't have to sit in this set of rules for our rest. For us, rest is just going to be an intentional, preventative, active time of renewal that God designed for us. Now, this doesn't mean that we're sitting still when we rest. We'll see later as we talk about applications for this that rest will often be really active, but it'll be something in opposition to your work because you may have a really physical job, and so rest will look like sitting in a jacuzzi and reading a book, but you may have a job where you study and read a lot, and so reading isn't going to be rest for you. Maybe you go for a run when you rest. Rest isn't always just sleeping. So our rhythm for today, as we talk, is we're going to do a little bit of learning about what God taught about rest, and then we're going to do a little bit of application about what we learned. So as we learn, we're going to look at the creation story and the Ten Commandments, and then we're going to see how Jesus can help us and cares for us while we rest. So there's really three main things that we're looking at. Rest, we are created for it. We are commanded to do it, and we're cared for in it. And so first... We are created for it. In the creation poem, God works for six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested. He finishes all his creative work, and then he steps back and looks at it. And I'll show you the verse where he very first rested. It's in Genesis 2, and it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. It's the seventh day of the creation poem. We see God resting. But God doesn't need to rest. Other parts of the Bible say God never gets tired. He never gets weary. So why is God resting? Well, let's step back. So he works for five days. He's creating, he's making, he's got birds and animals and fish. And then it's the sixth day. Does anyone know what he does on the sixth day? He makes us. And it must be really exhausting to make us because then on the seventh day, he needed to rest. No, I'm just kidding. We, even we can't exhaust God. Even we can't make God have to rest. So why does he actually rest? Well, how do kids learn? 
by watching their parents, right? You can tell your kids anything you want to tell them, but they are watching you to see how it really goes. And so God rested to show us, his kids, the importance of rest. God worked six days and rested one, but he made sure that the first thing we saw was rest. The first thing we experienced was seeing all that he had created and resting with him. Then we joined in. Then we went to work with him because we, we need to know that rest comes first. Then we join in the creation and the production and being a part of what God is already doing. Another just little thing, if you go and you read through Genesis 1, you'll notice that the way God sets it up is it's evening and then morning, the first day. We start with rest. We start with the evening. Then we get up and go, all right, God, what are you doing today? How can I join into this? Rest is not a reaction to exhaustion. It's the other way around. We have rested and then we look up and say, all right, what are we doing today? Have you ever been on a hike and you're so busy watching your feet because the ground is uneven that you don't even look around to where you are? And you went for a hike so you could see something pretty, but you're too busy watching your feet? We need to look up and look around, see how far we have come, see where we are and how beautiful it is, then start going again. It is up to us to rest first. We're created for it. But this work-rest rhythm is so important that it's not just built into the creation story, it's also included in that first list of how to be a healthy human that we call the Ten Commandments. So we're created for rest. Also, we are commanded to do it. If someone came up to you and asked you to name the Ten Commandments, do you think you could? I think if I got put on the spot, I might get a cup. I'd get like eight, maybe. Um, but they're set up really purposefully. So even though we're not going to go through all of them, I want to show you the purposefulness of what God set up. So in the Ten Commandments, the first three are love God. The fourth one is Sabbath rest. And then five through ten is love others. Do you see it? This pivot point of Sabbath and rest. This reminds us that we are not God but we also need to care for ourselves and love ourselves before we ever try to love other people. Other people are frustrating. Other people are hard. If we haven't rested first, we're not gonna be any good at loving people. So we've gotta care for ourselves before we move on to five through 10. I'm gonna read to you the fourth commandment because it's actually one of the longest ones, and it reminds us and calls us back to what we're created for while still commanding us to go ahead and rest. Here's what it says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and earth, remember that? The sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Rhythm, work, rest, work, rest. In the Ten Commandments, we are commanded to rest. We need rest like little kids, and we fight it like little kids too. And then we wonder why we're crying and angry and biting our friends. It's because we didn't rest first, and we need to rest. It is vital for us. It's a commandment for every created thing. And just a side note, if you are married, if you have kids, if you have best friends, if you have people you're super duper close to, how are you with them and rest? Do you let them rest? Because this commandment is for all of us, right? We tend to think of it for ourselves and especially if we're bad at it for ourselves, we're often not great at letting our loved ones rest too. And we punish them for the times that they want to rest? Do you let the people in your life rest? So there are so many scientifically proven self-care benefits to rest. We Rest is where our muscles rebuild. It's where they heal. It's where memories are formed. Information is processed. It's where gratitude gets felt. Your creativity improves when you rest. Productivity increases. Relationships grow. Health improves. This has been proven over and over and over again. And yet we still feel shame about needing to rest. Rest 
We're created for it. We are commanded to do it. And we are cared for in it. Science has proven how we are cared for in it. But also, we are cared for in our souls when we rest. Which brings us to Jesus and how he cares for us while we rest. So one day Jesus was asked about Sabbath and about rest and how we should follow the rules of rest. And he said, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Meaning, we are never meant to be slaves. Not to our work, not to our rest. We are not meant to be weighed down. This is supposed to be a gift to our bodies and our souls. One thing you can do when you're reading through, they're called the four gospels, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus's life, is you can look at what Jesus did on those rest Sabbath days and then start to see what he will do for you when you rest. Because a lot of times Jesus is held up as this example of what we should be like, right? But he also was God on earth. So you can see what Jesus did on the Sabbath and then you get to see what God does while you rest. And there's three things I wanna just quickly show you that Jesus did on the Sabbath that he does in our spirits when we rest. So the first one is God de Jesus declared that he was the Messiah. Meaning, for those of us who have a hard time resting, this one is probably the most important one for you. Jesus is the savior of the earth, not you. God is God and you are not. I am not God. The earth does not depend on me. When we rest, we remember our place in the universe. As my friend said the other day, I can resign as manager of the universe. We can expect God to take care of it while we rest. So surrender. In those moments where you're supposed to be resting, really rest. Throw yourself into it. And appreciate and worship and trust that while you rest, Jesus will remind you that he's got it handled and you can rest. The second thing is Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Those four books go way out of their way to make sure we see how often Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. There are at least seven stories just about that alone. And that should stop us in our tracks. That should remind us that it is in rest that we are healed. We don't have to fight for our healing. It is in our rest that Jesus will come and heal us. When we rest, we heal. Science shows it to us, but also the Bible shows it to us too. And then the third thing is Jesus taught people on the Sabbath. And he will teach you and speak to you when you rest. You will receive epiphanies and new ideas that you never would have had if you just kept watching your feet and doing your work. When we stop and look up and look around, that's when we can hear God the clearest. We are cared for in rest. Rest is a gift to us. Listen, before we move on to the applications of how we apply this to our lives, you have to know that if you don't know how much your life matters, you're not going to rest. You're going to put your nose to the grindstone, try to make other people's lives great, which is admirable, but will kill you. And you need to know that your life has a purpose and you need to rest so that you can be everything God has designed you to be. This is why we have that growth track class, is we want everyone who comes to the crossing to know how they are designed and what they're meant to be, and that God will empower you to do that. Before we ever get into the applications of this, you're not going to apply it if you don't think your life matters. You're alive. Your life matters. No shallow drowning for anyone here. We all need a rhythm of rest, this intentional, preventative, regularly scheduled rest. So one prescription for this rhythm that I love and the one we will end with is Rick Warren, the author of Purpose Driven Life. He has a great prescription that really can work for anyone, no matter what your life looks like. And it goes like this. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, abandon annually. No matter what your life is like, you can do this. And divert daily, we'll spend the most time on because it's within our individual days that it can be really hard for us to rest. And the first thing we got to do is look at what is restful for me. Like we mentioned earlier, if you, I have a friend who his whole life, his whole work is studying, reading, thinking. And so he had heard reading was good to help you rest and he'd go home and try to read, but that just made him feel more tired. And it's because it was the same kind of thing he was doing all day for work. You need something in your rest that's different from your work. And so now that guy goes and gets up early and plays basketball, and he's the most rested he's ever felt because he's doing something different 
from what he normally does. Same thing happened for me. I would try to sit and read or listen to podcasts during my resting time, but so much of my life is spent on studying and reading that I never really felt satisfied or rested. And now that I get up early and go work out and make my body work hard while my brain can just rest and I do what someone tells me to do, it's wonderful. And I actually feel way more rested, even though I'm technically getting less sleep and working harder. But it's that balance of rest. Pay attention to what fills your soul. It could be gardening. It could be playing with your kids. It could be going for a run or going for a swim or sitting at the beach or sitting somewhere and reading because all you do is work hard physically all day. If you're a mom and you've got little tiny kids and you're home with them right now, it might just be laying in a dark room, and that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> because that is the opposite of what you're doing all day. You wanna find where you've got balance. And for me, one of the best rhythms in my day is something that I learned. When you think about your brain as a muscle, you realize that it does get fatigued, and so it needs to rest more often than you wish it did. So if you, well, this is what I do when I've got a big project like a sermon. I'll set a timer for 90 to about 120 minutes, and I will work hard for that time, and I will focus, and I will not let myself get distracted, and I will not work just halfway. But when that timer goes off, I know that I've got 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the day, to just do whatever I want and rest. No guilt, no shame, no fear. If I get caught resting, I'm not allowed to feel bad about it. I'll go and just sit in the sun out there and just think. Because you've got to build into your time. Then I go back. I do another hour and a half of work, and my brain is fresh, and I've received epiphanies because Jesus teaches when we rest, and I feel like I don't have to worry because God's got this because Jesus is the Savior, not me, and it helps me get through these big projects. Divert daily, every day. Build in intentional rest time. Find your rhythm. Withdraw weekly is one where it does not need to be a whole day. Don't let it daunt you just because you think you have to have 24 hours of resting. Pick the chunk of time that you can start with. Maybe it's four hours on a Sunday, and you know that in that four hours, you're not gonna do any chores, you're not gonna try to accomplish anything, you're gonna find something that fills your soul. Also, usually you should put your phone away from you during this time. Because our phones are this constant like, hey, make something, hey, do something, hey, do a thing, hey, do a thing. And then we don't feel rested. Another really important thing with withdraw weekly, please coordinate with your families. Because if one of you is trying to rest and the other one thinks it's time to clean the garage, that will cause conflict. And then that's not restful and no one's happy. So with that one especially, you need to coordinate with the people that you love so that you all can rest and not hate each other. And then the last one, Abandon annually. When you work really, really hard, if you can be diligent and plan a rest time that you know is gonna be equal in its rest, then you can work with your whole heart because you know you're gonna rest with your whole heart. And so once a year, even if it's just three days, but hopefully it's a week, abandon everything and put it on your calendar so you know you've got that waiting for you. It will help you work harder and then it in itself will have a value of refreshing you. There's no prescription for all of us. There's no thing that's going to work for everyone. But this is a good way to, go, to look at your life and say, all right, am I doing this? How am I diverting daily, withdrawing weekly, abandoning annually? It's a step of faith to rest. It takes work to rest. It just does. And so we've got to be in this together. Start today. Build intentional times of rest into your schedule. No more shallow drowning. No more pushing to do one more thing. After service today, we are we're gonna have baptisms, first of all, after this service. So stay and cheer and get excited for the people who are getting baptized. We also are gonna hand you a popsicle when you get to the top of the stairs because obviously we need to just rest. Eat a popsicle, enjoy yourself, walk slowly in the sun. If you're an introvert, just eat your popsicle in a way that makes people not talk to you. And then if you're an extrovert, go say hi to somebody. And if they're an introvert, they'll just wave at you and keep walking and it's fine. <laughs> Take 10 minutes to just rest while you are here. It's part of why we come here. You come and we agree that we're going to sit in a room and you don't get to choose what gets taught on this stage, right? But you say, I'm going to go rest. I'm going to see what God wants to say to me while I sit still for half an hour and learn something and receive something and then go outside and walk around and remember that 
God is in charge and we are not, and there is a value to rest that is immeasurable. We covered a lot of ground. There's a lot of things that we learned. So the only way to receive it properly is to really rest. We're going to pray here together in a moment, but I want to show you what we're going to pray through because hopefully one of these three things applies to you. And as we then pray through them, you can really, with open hands, ask for this. So the first one is, if you've never invited Jesus into your life, never said, I actually really do want to follow Jesus and see what this rhythm of grace is like, what this freedom and lightness can look like, then during this next prayer, let's say yes to that. If you need trust to be able to rest properly, then let's take some time to pray for trust that we would have the faith to know that God works when we rest. Or maybe for you, it's that you need the discipline to actually create a new rhythm, to look at your calendar, to carve out that time, to have intentional preventative times of rest. Let's pray together. Jesus, what a gift it is that you put rest at the center of our lives. The very first thing we saw you do was rest. Then we joined in with you in the creation of the world. God, thank you that we can rest with no guilt and no shame. Thank you that rest is what fuels our work and our purpose. God, each one of us has a purpose, and I ask that you would show that to us as we work and as we rest especially. I pray for all of us in this room who have never really officially said, hey, Jesus, I want you in my life, that right now in this space of prayer and resting, we would just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Would you please be in my life? Would you please show me how to live with freedom and grace and rhythm? Show me how loved I am and the purpose on my life. God, for those of us who we need your help trusting you, that it is okay to rest. God, would you just call us out, help us to surrender in those moments of rest, to say you are God and we are not, and it is okay to just look up and see the beauty, see how much we've done, see what's ahead of us, and most of all, see you and what you are doing. God, help me to trust you more. God, for those of us who need a little bit of discipline to get this thing right, we need to carve out time. We need to get a little stubborn and protect our rest times, especially diverting daily, but also withdrawing weekly and abandoning annually. God, help us to lay out our lives in an intentional way so that we can actually rest and receive all the benefits of rest. Just remind us, just whisper in our minds today, hey, sit down, let's plan out some rest. God, help us to do that today. Most of all, God, thank you for the crossing. Thank you for this place where we can safely come together and rest and learn and hear you. Thank you for the people who are getting baptized. May we just cheer them on and be excited for the decision they've made to truly and officially let you be the center of their lives. And thank you for the people in this room. God, would you remind us each to rest. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I'll see you outside. I was dead.